Thank you to President Bergeron and blessed evening to everyone participating in this convocation. My purpose this evening is to, one, share a Tupac poem, two, have us think about where we fit into the parts of the poem, and three, how the poem ties to our own individual development, a liberal arts education, and our futures. The discipline of human development is the study of how and why people change over time with the goal of examining all parts of a person's life, our past, present, and the trajectory of our future. It includes examination of our physical, cognitive, psychosocial, and spiritual, if it individually applies, as well as the interaction of all of the environmental systems and various contexts that surround us, including but not limited to the economic, the medical, the psychological, historical, etc. Most importantly, it examines the potential resources that can be engaged in order to help improve our developmental path. It's a very multidisciplinary field that here at Connecticut College is nestled within the interdisciplinary tradition of liberal arts colleges and education. So thinking about human developmental processes, interdisciplinary liberal arts, and Tupac Shakur is like normal stuff here. One thing that I have come to appreciate is a concept that I learned from a 1994 book by M. Shuja called Too Much Schooling, Too Little Education, A Paradox of Black Life in White Societies. Shuja argues that schooling is a form of learning that helps to maintain the status quo. It is a form of learning often imposed on black, brown, and indigenous bodies that encourages the perpetuation of systems of oppression that, for example, keep the poor poor and the rich rich. It also is one of the many ways that our nation continues to have stronger than ever problems with health disparities, racism, violence, police brutality, the preschool to prison pipeline, mass child detention camps, among many other social oppressions. Unlike schooling, however, education is a form of learning that insists on interrupting the status quo. Its purpose is to emancipate so that people can have a voice to resist oppression and hopefully live more empowered lives. Education encourages questioning and engaging others while also demanding change in the policies and social structures that hinder healthy living. This concept of schooling versus education caused a gradual shift in my teaching over the years. For many, Growth over time has been like a rose bush seedling trying to push its way through only a tiny crack within a long stretch of concrete. This is a concept that I learned through the poetry of Tupac Shakur. Although Tupac Shakur was a prolific rapper, he also was a teen poet with volumes of poems, most of which were written between the ages of 15 and 19. Tragically, Tupac died in 1996 at the age of 25, although he lived five years longer than he expected. He was convinced that the systemic conditions and violence surrounding him would kill him at an earlier age. Ironically, I used to think very stereotypically about Tupac until a beloved teenager educated me on who Tupac really was. I'm no poetry scholar, but I found myself captivated by Tupac's poetry and surprised to discover his teen ideals of gender, equality, feminism, faith in God, social justice, anti-drug abuse, and anti-violence. Tupac's Rose poem goes like this. Did you hear? 
Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long lived the rose that grew from concrete when no one else even cared. I would like to take a few moments to talk about the rose, the concrete and its cracks, and the air or lack thereof. So first, there's the rose. It's an extraordinary image, a tiny, delicate plant or flower pressing and pushing so fervently to obtain fresh air that it pushes itself through a crack in concrete. However, with such extraordinary pushing can come burdens, even precarities and catastrophes that other pe people may not seem to face as often or even notice. Imagine the amount of work to push through this crack and the danger of being trampled on in the process by people who may not even grasp one's presence nor potential and most importantly, one's right to be there. No doubt there are a bazillion interpretations, but thinking developmentally is my go-to, of course. Then the concrete. I see this very vulnerable plant growing underneath an extremely oppressive, hard environmental structure. I want to know who put that monstrosity of a structure there, who mandated it, who did the labor for minimum wage to build it, if they were paid at all, and who is benefiting from its presence. How were whole communities, whole tribes, even nations removed in order to make room for this structure? On whose backs has the concrete been poured and what are the impacts of this even today? Why does any rose still have to push through concrete for the hope of growing to live a safe, prosperous, and fulfilled life? Indigenous, black, and brown bodies huddled and buried under concrete slabs of white supremacy incessant footsteps walking over us, inhabiting our ability to move freely and to breathe. We still can't breathe. And who's still getting rich off of this? These are education as opposed to schooling questions. This is for what a liberal arts education aims, or it should if it doesn't. I want my students to go out into the world with eyes wide open, trying to figure out how they can question, challenge, partner, and collaborate in order to break up some concrete and restructure things so that everyone has an equitable chance in life. Then there's the crack in the concrete. Poet and songwriter Leonard Cohen once wrote, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Thus, the crack may represent brokenness and imperfection to some, but to others, it may represent light, air, opportunity, and hope. Then there's the lack of air. We can consider that airlessness keeps people from breathing right, if at all, when living under poured concrete or heavy systemic structures. A lack of air may represent additional forms of inequitable, oppressive, exploitive, and violent practices, all of which can kill us. And then the dirt. In order for the rose to grow, there has to be some dirt somewhere. Dirt represents earth, nutrients, sustainability, strength, land, blackness, black pride. 
Thus, figuratively, under the concrete are the people, the communities who have been oppressed by all of the social structures that disproportionately have hindered black, brown, and indigenous bodies. That invisible dirt where that rose is growing represents some of the strongest transplanted nations, tribes, and involuntary immigrants to ever exist on this earth. We are those whose labor and strength built this country, and we yet still hold the nation up. And, and we've tended to be a forgiving and loving people. Somehow we haven't burnt much down nor shot up hardly anything if you consider all done to us. If black folks retaliated for all done against us during these 500 or so years, this whole country and everything in it would have burned down hundreds of years ago. In this decade of Trayvon, Tamir, Sandra, George, Tony, Brianna, and incalculable numbers of slaughtering, Anyone who can't say that they would trade places with a young black teen or adult right now is in no position to judge black people or our allies as we try to cope and demand change. But getting back to the dirt, the dirt has concrete weighing on it, preventing it to breathe. Because of the nutrients though in the dirt, the constant inspirational pushing and sacrificings of the elders, the ancestors, the children, and the angels, and God, even a rose seedling can manage to thrive where there is no air. This dirt is so rich and full of nutrients that America, as we know it, was built on it and has sustained itself on it. The nutrients in that dirt are what allow black, brown, and indigenous people to make a way out of no way, and that same dirt also absorbs our tears. It's our creativity, our innovativeness, the richness of our cultures, our ancestral spirits and strength, our most often faith in God. It's our Negro spirituals and tribal chants, our community activists, our martyrs and allies, Four precious little girls, many skittle-eating or park-playing teenagers, and adults just trying to be. The concrete is American oppression as a whole. The dirt are the people who gave their lives to build this country with their own bare hands. The roses are the nation's generations of children who've been and continue to be crushed in a multitude of ways. Above the concrete, not only does the rose want to breathe, it wants to breathe fresh air. Quiet as it's kept, the folks accustomed to walking powerfully on top of the concrete are breathing air, but often it's not the fresh air that Tupac envisioned. Instead, many are breathing religious bigotry, racism, misogyny, heterosexism, homophobia, transphobia, greed, white supremacy, internalized racism, etc., and often don't even know it. However, many also are getting educated, but others rather stay steeped in any toxicity that gives them the historical advantages to which they generationally have been accustomed. But eventually, toxicity will choke the life out of everyone. In an interview, Tupac further elaborated on the rose. He said, you try to plant something in the concrete. If it grow and the rose petal got all kinds of scratches and marks, you're not going to say, dang, look at all the scratches and marks on the rose that grew from concrete. No, you're going to be like, dang, a rose grew from the concrete? Dang, he grew out of that? He came out of that? That's what you should say. All the trouble to survive and make good out of the dirty, nasty, unbelievable lifestyle that they gave us. That's what Tupac said. Tupac recognized that his conditions were not his or his community's fault 
but rather the conditions were created and imposed upon him by the structural forces that still, almost 35 years after his poem, still haven't changed much. Now, you might be asking yourself, where am I in this scenario? Am I a rosebush seedling? Am I the concrete benefiting on the backs of others with no debts to nor appreciation of that? Am I the richness of the resources that inspire and push the rose up as it struggles to find its way through tiny cracks? Am I fresh air that is someone who has the benefit of being on the other side, but also hopefully serving or partnering as a restorative ally who fights to change oppressive structures? Or am I the polluted air of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and exploitation? Which ones am I, and to whom do I owe gratitude and commitment? To whom do I owe remediation? reparations and or restoration for unearned privileges and benefits that I and or my loved ones, my community and society enjoy on the daily at someone else's or their descendants' cost. These are human developmental questions, as well as economics, education, biology, history, sociology, chemistry, psychology, and so many other disciplines questions. These are liberal arts education questions. These are educational as opposed to schooling questions. This is learning at Connecticut College, and if it isn't, it needs to be, because people unnecessarily are dying even as I am speaking. So in closing, in another interview, Tupac leaves us with this. He says, you see, you wouldn't ask why the rose that grew from the concrete had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would all celebrate its tenacity. We would all love its will to reach the sun. Well, we are the roses. This is the concrete and these are my damaged petals. Don't ask me why, thank God, and ask me how, said Tupac. And herein lies developmental processes, some of the ideals of liberal arts education, Tupac, Trayvon, Brianna, and be it good or bad, each and every one of us. Thank you. <laughs>